Hi there. Welcome to the Sober Circle channel. Enjoy this speaker tape. Our speaker tonight is a lady from Ann Arbor, Michigan. I've talked to her a few minutes this moment, this morning. I found out she's from the Washington Noah Council on Alcoholism. She's with the City of Abuse Clinic and the Brighton Hospital. I know she got up at 6.15, ate breakfast at 7 a.m., and said she slept like a baby. Now, I used to sleep like a baby, too. I woke up screaming every hour on the hour, wanting that drink. But I think she meant it the other way. So without any further ado, I give you our speaker tonight, Holly Martin. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Holly Martin, and I'm an alcoholic. First, I'd like to thank you for inviting me over to share your conference with you. To me, to be asked to do anything on Saturday night, especially to try to carry the message, is absolutely marvelous. But the simple reason is that I got the message on a Saturday night a few days ago. And uh, that was the beginning of a miracle. The miracle of it was that, number one, that I happened to be home on Saturday night. <laughs> the other part of the miracle is that I wasn't drunk. I was drinking, but I wasn't out completely as yet. The radio happened to be on, and it wasn't on because I turned it on to this particular station. It was just on because for the simple reason, well, when I bought the radio, I was already hearing voices, so uh, it didn't make any difference whether it would be on or off. I heard them anyway. And I happened to be sitting at the kitchen table that Saturday night. Of all the places, at the kitchen table by myself. Well, not exactly by myself, because I had Sweet Lucy there with me. <laughs> and, uh, wine. <laughs> now, I'm not going to give you a drunk log Now, I promise you that. I'm not going to do that. For, that that's a silly. Everybody knows how to drink. You open your mouth and you swallow it and you drink. Uh, I know what it means to wake up at 6 o'clock and look at the clock and it says 6 and you don't know what 6 it is. Uh, whether it's 6 in the morning or 6 in the evening. And uh, you're scared to ask anybody. You'd love to have a drink of water, but you're scared to go get it because somebody might say, are you just coming in or what are you doing up so early? So you don't get a drink of water. And you simply lay there and suffer. Finally, you have to go to the bathroom and you're scared for the same reason. So you lay there and you suffer to both ends. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you about all the pawn shops. That's not necessary. I know about them, though. I had a watch that stayed in the pawn shop so much it wouldn't run on a Jewish holiday. <laughs> the, uh... <laughs> so I, I know about those things. See? I want to tell you about that Saturday night. So, that was really an event, my friend. So this particular Saturday night, I, both of my children were asleep. And as I sat there, I other than for the grace of God that I would be home and not completely out. Story came on over this radio. And uh, the story was called a glass crutch. 
and it was about a woman that had a drinking problem. Now, I don't remember any of the ingredients of this story at all. All I know it was about a woman that had a drinking problem and uh, was called the glass crutch. Now, I didn't know that uh, anything about AA. People that I had met in my life, they were not remotely interested in AA, uh, one way or the other. They all lived a very, uh, shall we say, sheltered life. <laughs> and, uh, oh, they were elites. They, they had winter homes and summer homes. Those that, um, uh, in the winter time, uh, they went to the Isle of Corrections. <laughs> and, uh, in the summertime, they went to the park. <laughs> All those kind of people. <laughs> in fact, I had a very lovely... I had even married by that time. And uh, the man that I married had lived a sheltered life. <laughs> he, he was... Uh, well, that's his story, but he lived a sheltered life. When he wasn't sheltered in Jackson Prison, he sheltered in House Correction. <laughs> and uh, he was a gambler. I got rid of him right quick because he was throwing it away faster than I could drink it up, and I couldn't get out of it. So, so now I, here I am home on Saturday night with two children. Okay. And I'm listening to this radio, and this story comes on as I told you about this woman that had a drinking problem. And uh, I thought right then and there, if she would just quit drinking whiskey and get some wine, she'd be all right. That's a <laughs> and the story said, if you ever need our number, we'll be the first number in the book. And it went on to talk about AA, I presume, or something. But it said, if you ever need our help, we'll be the first number <laughs> in the book. Well, I thought I'd never need those people. I'm a perfectly all right. Nothing wrong with me at all, you know? Perfectly all right. But the simple reason is, I know when to stop drinking. I, I knew exactly when to stop drinking, see? You stop drinking when you don't have anything else to drink. That's when you stop drinking, one of those kind of things. But you can always find something. But then I'm going to tell you something about that story. You see, uh, it has been said to people like you and I time and time again, and I believe this with all of my heart. You don't choose God. God chooses you. He chooses you. And don't ever tell him, unless you mean it from the bottom of your heart, do with me what you will, O oh Lord, because he'll naturally pour it on you. <laughs> mm -hmm. He'll do that. But this story, if anybody has ever read The Hound of Heaven, my friends, this is what I went through about six or seven years prior to my coming in to AA. Six or seven years prior to that. Coming into AA is when I heard that story. Called The Glass Crutch. And I can remember, now just every night, nor did it happen every week or every month. But at certain intervals over those six or seven years, this is what happened to me. Be walking down the street, and the heel plates on my shoes would beat out the words, the glass crutch. Mm -hmm. I can remember at certain intervals, sitting in the living room, the clock on the wall didn't say tick-tock. It said the glass crutch, the glass crutch. I remember one day trying to read the newspaper. And it seemed as if every word on that newspaper said the glass crutch. And I said, oh, my Lord, what does this mean? And it dawned on me then. After all of this time, it dawned. My eyes left the newspaper and fell out on my hands. It dawned on me exactly. Holly Martin, you can't even read the newspaper without the glass crutch. Because here I sat holding a glass of my favorite beverage, wine. Now, it would sound real dramatic to say immediately, 
I dropped the glass and ran to the phone book. I did no such thing. <laughs> I said, I'll do. Uh -uh, I don't need that. And I didn't know what it was that I didn't need, but I know I needed something, but that wasn't it. Finally, 24 hours later, I'm sitting in that same chair, and I opened the book. I said, that line, it isn't going to be there anyway, you know. And I opened the book, and there it was, my friends, right there. First number in the book. Well, I call that number, and I told the lady, I said, you know, I got a friend out here. I think she's losing her mind. Uh, would you like to have somebody come out, uh, send somebody out to talk to her? And the lady said, would you like to have somebody talk to you? I said, oh, no, 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 no. not me. Uh-uh. Finally, I called back again, and this time I very reluctantly gave her my name. And uh, then she said, well, have somebody come out to see you. Well, you know, alcohol is everything the big book says it is, cunning, baffling, and powerful. So you see, the day I called that number, I had reached the stage of zombieism. That is, if you don't drink, you don't get sober. If you do drink, you don't get drunk. You know, you're a zombie, one of those kind of things. Just about 45 minutes for this lady to come out to see me, two lush-haired friends of mine came by, my buddies, <laughs> and they gave me a couple of drinks of something, and it was the same as pouring coal oil into dying embers. I got drunk all over again. But uh, she took me on to this meeting. Now, I don't remember too much about that first meeting that I attended. Very little do I remember about it. But there is one thing that stuck in my mind. And it was these words. Rarely have we ever seen a person fail. And I went back to my second meeting to find out what they were drinking that rarely ever fails. <laughs> but I do remember another thing when this woman walked into the meeting with me. Four other gals jumped up. I guess I looked so bad. And said, we'll help you with her. They thought they were going to get to be my pallbearers. And I'm still around. And one of them, I, I was scared of this woman. I will not lie. I, I was scared of her, really. She she, she looked like a, a Comanche chief, you know. <laughs> and uh, she kept reading this who me to me. See, I took a very dim view of everything anybody said. And uh, she let me out. She said, don't, don't, drink till, don't drink today. I said, okay. Anything she said was all right with me. And then another thing that got next to me, and I couldn't understand you people, you said, we want to be your friend. I thought that I had a little fix for me to be their friend. It must be awful hard up for friends. You know? I want somebody like me to be a friend. And then she began to see me. She kept reading this blessed who me to me over and over, and you know, and she kept saying, I just answer yes to see, Jerry, and you're in. I thought the old biddy's getting 50 cents a yes. <laughs> so she'd read it, you know. It's drinking, clouding your reputation. Just answer yes, dear. Well, I figured it like this. If you've been in a fog 27 years, how do you know whether it's cloudy or not? <laughs> Then she'd come on with another one of them dumb questions. Do you seek a lower environment while drinking? I said, hell no, I merely create a lower environment while drinking. <laughs> and then she'd come up with a doozy. And this was it. Do you prefer to drink alone? I said, if I'm buying it, yes. If you're buying it, no. <laughs> You know? 
such harassment. You know? oh, oh, it really did. This, this woman, she, she really, she harassed the living hell out of me, you know, all the time. And then, he, and you know, it was four of them and just one of me, and you know, one of those kind of things. And, and you know, they, they would stand out there and they'd look at me, you know. One, oh, they did some sponsoring in those days. I'm telling you, honey, they really sponsored you. You were sponsored from way back. I'm telling you, see. Uh, it's just like a friend of mine was saying to me the other day. She belongs to the same church I do. And uh, I guess I had spoken out of term or somebody hadn't. She says, well, now, don't you, now, Holly, you belong to an organization. Don't you all know anything about the Robert's Book of Rules or Robert's Rules? I said, no, we don't go by nothing like that. And she says, well, when someone speaks out of order, what do you say to them? I said, jump shot, and wait your turn come. <laughs> Since like on the day, but when I first came in and you opened your mouth, they said, "Shut up! You don't know nothing." <laughs> and it was three months before I knew anything. They didn't know anything. You said, "Let's just say nothing," you know. But you know, I love those old gals. One or two of them are still left, and I really and truly love them very, very dearly because friends, they really and truly saved my life. I'm telling you, this program saved my life, see. And that is why, my friends, on Saturday nights especially, when I have the privilege, the honor of being with you, my friends, that I am so very, very grateful that you invited me. And you know, when I look back over those wasted years, you know, I, I, naturally I know that they were wasted, but I know it was for something. You see, this program justifies my existence. It really and truly does. Other than that, what else have I? Yeah. The only other thing that I can lay claim to is that I gave birth to two children. And every once in a while, you know, I'll wear back, you know, and say, Oh, I raised two beautiful children. Well, let's look at it like this. My son, Mike, God raised Michael, his sister, Leslie, Michael raised Leslie. All I ever raised was hell. I didn't raise nobody. <laughs> well, sure, I worked. Yes, I worked very hard. I worked two jobs. That's the reason why it doesn't hurt me to work three now, because I'm used to working two. I always did, you know. I always worked hard. In fact, I always worked in a bar. I had on-the-job training, you know. <laughs> and, and then I had a job in the daytime. Friends, and this is no lie. And then I took him wash and ironing in between because I had to drink. Like, it's one of those kind of things. And I had that, what you might call that stubborn alcoholic pride that I wasn't going to ask you or nobody else for nothing. Say, these are my children. I will take care of them. And I did. You better believe it. There was very little discipline around the house, you know, after all. Uh, they turned out to be marvelous people, too. Lovely people. Oh, who in the world is going to hit a kid when you got a hangover? You give him a quarter and send him to the show. You know, you don't hit anybody. So you just say, honey, you run on down to the show. Now, Mama's got a terrible headache or something like that, that hangover. <laughs> One of those kind of but as time went on, this program, I, it just didn't seem like it was getting through to me. No, I didn't take a drink because I was scared. After all, this four mafia leaders that I had there, I was about to drink, you know. And, uh, but I didn't take that drink. So one of them told me one day, she said, um, Holly, you know, this is a beautiful adventure, our new way of life. She says, it's a beautiful adventure. And my friends, it is. Because I call these 12 beautiful steps my journey into sobriety. 
That's what, the, that's what it is to me, these 12 steps. We don't like to talk about them too much today, do we, you know? In other words, we want to just do one and uh, the first part of one and part of the twelfth one. You know, I admit I'm parlous over alcohol and uh, I'm going to carry the message. Carry what, where, to who? You know, I'm not going to carry nobody's thing. And we get very sophisticated, you know, and we go around talking about them. And, you know, J.C., isn't that a duck? <laughs> J.C. This is ridiculous, friends. Nobody knows our divine Lord that well as to nickname him J.C. You know, one of those kind of things. And another thing that it just kind of, you know, it, it kind of gets up under your skin that all of a sudden that here you are, you know, that you can be so familiar with divine, with divinity, that you can nickname it, you know. See, my grandfather's name was Scott Martin. And do you know one thing? If I'd ever nicknamed named him and called him Scotty, I wouldn't have been standing here tonight, friends. I got news for you. Well, that old man was something else. He didn't trust nobody, nothing. He wore both belt and suspenders. He didn't trust his pants, you know. <laughs> he was that kind of person, you know. <laughs> And uh, you didn't learn how to drink in his house, you'd better believe it. No. But that's where I got my first drink, because he had this alcohol, you know, in a bottle in the dresser drawer. And uh, But he had roots and rock candy and all that crap in there. And he had arthritis, and he would, I'd see him on wet, damp days, he would cripple over there to the dresser drawer and he'd get the bottle out and he'd take a swig or two out of it and he'd sit down and rub his leg and then he could walk away. I looked at him and I'd watch him from time to time and then one day I walked over to the drawer and I took a swig out of it and I sat there for a while and I crippled away. <laughs> you know? And uh, so I got my first drink out of curiosity and from there on in, baby, I was on my own. You know, one of those things. But this sponsor of mine, this one that I think I was closer to her, the one that told me about this beautiful, to look upon this as a beautiful adventure. Do you know when one starts on a journey, it is a known fact that the first thing that you do is to get your car into good running condition. And you're not going to take it to a plumber or somebody like that. You're going to take it to the best mechanic that you can find. Go. Why? You want it in good running order. That's why it's so necessary for you and I to try to feel well, you know. Because if we don't feel good, we don't hear well. So hence the necessity of trying to feel good. Now, once one is on getting ready for his journey, the next thing that we will do is to go to our automobile club and have them to map out for us the route to take, you know? Now, if I was going to drive in a car, all the way down here. The first thing that they would tell me would be, now just simply get on I-75 and you won't miss it. Now there's some exits, but don't take them. Just stay on I-75 and you'll get down to Kentucky. They'll tell me that. So in my journey into sobriety, the Chapter 5 tells me how to get here. It says, rarely have we seen a person fail that has thoroughly followed our path. It says that. You know, get on that path and stay on that. And it's true. Now, there is another thing other than this road map that you and I have, and I look upon these, this big book as my road map. That is it. But now along the way, regardless of how well that I know how to drive, if I do not obey the signs that I see along the road, I'm going to get in trouble. You know? 
And one of the first signs that one sees along the road is that we don't pay attention to. We didn't pay attention to that. We ran through it time and time again. It's the first step where we admitted we were powerless over alcohol and our lives had become unmanageable. We see a sign in the road that says stop. You know? Now, it's a known fact. When you see that sign, it means exactly what it says. Stop! Now, the police should get up beside you or kind of roll up along the woods beside you, you know, and you've gone through it. You say, but Mr. Officer, I was tapering off, you know? <laughs> this only aggravates things, you know? Because the sign says, stop! <laughs> and you're going to tell them you're tapering off in the same way here. When it's time to stop, you quit. Yeah. Now, what are some of the signs that we saw along the road that we ran through? And when I use that word, we, friends, I'm talking about Holly. One of them was a sneaking drink. That, that's a beautiful stop sign. Sneaking drink. Yeah. Got to sneak and drink it. Now, that, I should have known there was something wrong then. When you have to sneak a drink, you don't want anybody to see you do it. And then if somebody does see you, the first thing you say, well, it's legal, and then well, it's legal, what the hell are you slipping and doing it for? You can do it. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you got company, and you're serving them in the living room, and you ain't in the kitchen gulping them down. Real quick, come on. Then you come back and grin, and you know, and these kind of things smile to everybody. You just gulped down half of the bottle before you got in there, you know. And then we begin to break promises, you know. Somebody says, uh, Oh, aren't you going to take me such and such place tomorrow? Are you going with me? You promised to go, but you never get there. You know, in other words, or if you do go, and then say, Well, now look. Will you please stay sober and we'll go such and such a place? You say, yes. Mm -hmm. Then when you get home, you say, now, what night nice can I have a fifth? You know, died at night last night. Mm -hmm. Then we become quarrelsome. That's a good stop sign. Always very quarrelsome for the simple reason is, i got to pick a quarrel with you so you won't talk to me about my drinking. I don't care how nice you are. I've got to start a quarrel. If I come home early in the morning and you're good to me, I'm going to start a quarrel with you. You know, you're just like the man that walked in there one morning, you know. His wife is trying to be real nice to him. She says, dear, can I fix you some breakfast? Yeah, you can if you want them. She says, well, what do you want? He says, um, give me two eggs. She says, dear, how do you want them? He says, uh, no, boil one and fry one. So she did. <laughs> she brought him back. She boiled one and fried one. And we looked at it. Ah, you boiled the wrong one. You, know? <laughs> so, you see, you just can't see us nice. <laughs> so we got to become quarrelsome. That's a good stop thing right then and there. And then we become preoccupied with drinking. Preoccupied. And at first, I couldn't wait till Friday night. And then, uh-uh. Why well, wait till Friday night? I, then I got to Friday noon. And so forth and so on. Preoccupied with it. That's all I thought about. Watching the watch. How, how soon am I going to get out of here so I can go get me a drink? Avoiding all, shall we say, I, any reference to drinking. Anytime anybody talked about drinking, I didn't want to hear that. See. Now, that was a stop sign. Why is it when there's literature laid around, put up under your nose, or something in the newspaper, you don't want to read it, you don't want to hear tell of it. It's a good sign. And deliberately making other people mad. You know, get mad first. First and foremost. Because why? I want you to tell me, well, you hurry up and get on out of here. I wanted to go anyway, you know. But you want somebody to tell you to get out. And then, stop sign of all stop signs, blackouts, my friends. 
Now, I didn't know what a blackout was, so I came to AA. I just thought I'd lose my mind on installment plans. I didn't know what that was. <laughs> but every one of these stop signs, I ran through them. Same. And then as we travel on our journey into sobriety, we see another sign in the road that says to yield. Came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Yield. Give over to something before you give out. Oh, many times we might say that we have a terrible time for that second step. Well, I, I just can't understand this God bit. I, I, I just don't buy this God bit, you know? After all, uh, isn't there any other way? Well, do you know, my friends, I think one of the greatest things that we learn in this program is what that big book tells me. Remember, you deal with alcohol, cunning, baffling, and powerful. Without help, it is too much for you. But there is one that has all power. That one is God. May you find him now. It says so in the book. And yet, you know, we're still are looking for that easier, softer way. Just don't tell me about that God. But, you know, after all, I'm going to my doctor and I'm going to my psychiatrist, you know, one of those kind of things. And uh, so after all, I just don't see where I need this God that I have my doctor and my psychiatrist. You lied like a dog to both of them, you know. <laughs> but now let's look at this deal. Now, I don't have anything against doctors. I'm not too much against psychiatrists. <laughs> not too much against them. But uh, let's look at it like this. Now, what did you learn at your mother's knee? Or somebody's knee? You learned about Humpty Dumpty, didn't you? that Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall, and Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. And all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Why? Let's look, if you will, at the good doctors that work like a horse. You know? So we will call them the king's horses. Now we will look at the psychiatrist with his nose up in the air, as the king's men. You know? Let's look at it. So we've got the king's horses and we've got the king's men, haven't we? So did Humpty Dumpty have the king's horses and the king's men. So have we got the doctors and the psychiatrists and God bless them. Say. But why is it they couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again? I'll tell you why. The good doctors and the good psychiatrists are only aides to the king. You see, you cannot build a bridge against, across the king's nose. You see, they forgot. The king's horses and the king's men forgot the call on the king. They. Remember, you deal with alcohol, cunning, baffling, and powerful. Without help, it's too much for you. You need more than the king's horses and the king's men. They are only aids to the king. You see. If Humpty Dumpty had just called on the king, he'd made it. <laughs> And you know, we can have so much faith in everything else. You say, well, I'm telling you, when it comes down to this God bit, I just don't see it. But we can put our faith in everything. How does one find a doctor in the first place? Somebody recommends him to you. Yeah. You know, thumb through the yellow pages when something hurts you, looking for a doctor, and say, oh, yeah, look under you for ulcers. Maybe I can find a doctor for that. Yeah. Somebody recommends a doctor to you, don't you? Now, you go to this man, you don't know him. Somebody recommended him to me, to you. Uh -huh. So you go there and you take off all your clothes and all that sort of thing, and he was just recommended to you. <laughs> and okay, you don't even know the man. <laughs> the 
But you go to it, don't you? Because somebody recommended him to you. And then the next thing you do, all right, he sits down and he writes out a prescription, don't you? You can't read it. Okay. <laughs> no. And you take it down to the pharmacist. You don't know him either, do you? And you hand him this note. You don't know what that prescription said. It could say, give this bastard something to kill him. <laughs> Uh -huh. <laughs> now let me recommend a physician for you. Let me recommend one for you. God could and would if he was sought. Says so in the book. Let me recommend him. Union came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Same thinking. The kind of thinking that tells me any time any person place a thing is so important that I've got to get drunk over it. Then that person place a thing is just too important for me. Really it is, my friend. You know? See, one of the biggest problems that I think sometimes that we might have is we got it a little bit backwards. See, the book of books where all of this come out of, and I know it come out of there because I run it down, it is there, you know? It says that God created man in his image. And you know what our problem is? We go around trying to create God in our image, the way we want him to be. And that's when we get in trouble, isn't it? So hence it is that we came to believe in a power, greater than ourselves. You know, I don't need that power greater than me. I can make it without that God bit. Well, you promise me one thing. The next time you get drunk and you go to puking, try stopping puking in the middle of a puke. <laughs> you can't do it. Sobriety, you know, we now see a sign in the road that says, wrong way, do not enter. Wrong way, do not enter. Yeah. Made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understand it. But yet we don't see this sign that says, wrong way, do not enter. Now, when you see a sign in the road that says, wrong way, do not enter, you're not going to be stupid enough to say, well, I'm going to drive down here a little bit and see just what's going to happen. You know, I don't believe it. I'm going to drive down here and see. You're not going to do that. But how often don't we say, I've got him, but i got to do it my way. But it, says, but it doesn't say that in the book. It says, made a decision. The privilege of decision. This is something that alcohol never permitted me to do was to make any kind of decision whatsoever. Yeah? Now, alcohol said to me, you will do it my way. You will not surrender your will to me. I will take and break your will. And that is exactly what it did. And you know, this is a privilege, my friends. Who else wants the life and the will of an alcoholic but God? Do you know anybody else that wants it? I do. Anybody else that would even have it? You know? You couldn't even down the cellar. I mean, say, oh, nobody wants the life and the will of an alcoholic. But here's our all-loving father. You know? And then sometimes, you know, we get, we say, well, this step is hard to take. I know it's hard to take. You know why it's hard to take? Because my life is unmanageable. It's hard for me to turn something that's unmanageable of my life over to anybody. So I have to ask, God, will you help me to turn my life and my will over to you? And once I'm asking him to help me turn my life and my will over to me, I, then I have no right whatsoever when a new person comes into this fellowship who to say to him or her, if he's having a problem, with the spiritual part of the program. 
Well, now, let's say the group is your higher power. Who's in the group? You're in the group. I'm in the group. Do you how in the hell do you look like being anybody's higher power? <laughs> I look at myself in the glass, and I'm going to look in the glass, and I see somebody's higher power. Isn't this a duck? You know? <laughs> somebody's higher power. Uh-uh. I'm not going to tell you to take my group as your higher power. We will help you all that we can. We need one another. But you see, my higher power don't do my kind of thinking. I don't get into trouble that I get into. You know, my life is still unmanageable today. But I know how to cope with it because I came to believe in a power. And I tried to make that decision to turn my life and my will over to him. See. But you see, I don't want to be your higher power. See. I'm not fit to be anybody's higher power. See. And I would hate to have to turn my life and my will over to the care of another human being, really and truly. Because, you know, human beings, they lie. I don't want a higher power that lies, they con, they cheat. They do all kinds of things, higher power that people do. They don't want a higher power like that. No wonder people are so confused today. When you turn your life and your will over to a group of people, this person over here, he's going to say, oh, it's all right to do that, honey. That's business principles. And somebody else over here says, don't do that. And somebody else says, that. well, you know, it's all right to go with so-and-so's husband, but just don't let so-and-so know. You know, that's okay. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, yeah, you know, you go down there and I'll show you where to meet somebody at, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, yeah, that's fine. And this is my eye power, huh? Oh, no, baby, you ain't going to confuse me like that. I've been confused enough. Uh-uh. So... And I see that sign that says, wrong way, do not enter. Mm -mm, I cannot do it my way. And as I travel on my journey into sobriety, I see a sign in the road that says, road under construction. You know? Made a searching and thorough moral inventory of ourselves. Now, what is the main reason that the road would be under construction? So that you and I might travel safely. That is why we take this searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. And what are some of the things that might cause the road to be under construction? What are the things we will find holes in the road? Do we not? Holes in the road. And as I look into my life, I see this emptiness in there. What caused this emptiness there? There is something missing, and unless I take an inventory, I won't find out what it is. You know. I don't know, you don't have it down here, in this part of the country, but that's where I came from. We've had it, we've had quite a bit of it. Where salt had to be poured on the road because of the vast amount of snow and ice that we've had. And salt has a tendency to eat away at the road. And this too causes the road to be under construction in the summer and in the spring. And let's identify this salt, if you will, as resentment. That resentment has been there and it has eat away at my life. And unless I take an inventory, I don't know that it's there. I don't know what causes it to be there. All I know it is there. Of course, I don't like to use the word resentment amongst alcoholics because that's for Alanon. Alanon's resent alcoholics just hate you. <laughs> but it's bad. <laughs> and then again, my friend, another thing that causes the road to be under construction is the heavy truck. You see, they, they put a lot of pressure on the road, you know. Some parts of the city, they don't even allow, allow heavy trucks to come through because they put too much pressure on the road. And let's apply that to us. Look at all the pressure that you and I have put on ourselves because we had to be first. We had to be the very best of everything. And sometimes even today in AA, we still got that push. I got to be first. For what? You know, so you can be last? That pressure. So someone will say, oh, you're so good. You, you work so hard. 
And then if somebody don't pat you on the back and tell you how sweet you are for working so hard, you're going to get drunk, aren't you? So they didn't tell you how nice you were. Yeah. So I put pressure on myself. And that's why I have to take this inventory. Where did this pressure come from? Most of the times I put it there myself. And then change of temperature causes the road to buckle. Maybe not down here, but where I came from. It's so cold one minute and then it gets hot. And it causes the road to buckle. And you know how you and I, all that change of temperature. One day we walk in the house and it's fine to do this. The kids is doing it. Oh, that's nice. The next time we walk in the house, what are you doing that for? Mm -hmm. Everything's all right one day and the next day it isn't. Why? And that old alcohol is working on me. Brother, it is really and truly working on me. That change of temperature that you and I can have. And finally, that day, you know, that we feel that we've been in jail. Oh, goodness, how this jail has tightened up on me. And we change from worse to worse. You know? Well, you know, you say, oh, what jail are you talking about, Holly? Just because I'm an alcoholic, I doesn't mean I've been in jail. i got news for you. Every alcoholic in the world has been in jail. What worse prison is when the bars is made out of pride and the walls is made out of fear and you sleep on the couch of remorse and you get up every morning and put on the only garment you own, one of self-pity, you know? And John Barleycorn is your warden and you are your own judge and jury and you cannot forgive yourself. And you go right back into that little cell again. It tells me to make a searching and fearless moral inventory of myself. Let's look at that white line down the middle of the road. Moral inventory. Alcohol has rubbed that line out, has it not? That line that says this car is still here and this car is still over there. Mm. We got that line all rubbed out in inventory. And when we take one, we see where it got rubbed out. Alcohol wiped it out. Did you ever say, you know, if I ever get as bad as so-and-so, I'm going to quit. Yeah. <laughs> if my morals ever get that low, I quit. Yeah. Well, I said that. The guy used to live next door to an old man, bless his heart. He always drank his whiskey out of a mason jar. I never knew why. And he always put sugar in it and stirred it. And he would get so drunk he would run backwards. And I would look at him, you know. And I would say, if I ever get that drunk, I'd quit. And I'd look at old man Brown out the window, you know, and he would be out there with this mason jar with a spoon in it. And one day I didn't have anything to drink, and I was looking for old man Brown's mason jar, you know. <laughs> And finally, I did get something to drink, and as the day went on, I got drunker and drunker. And do you know what? And friends, this is the truth. Do you know who I ran into? Backwards, old man Brown. First thing went through a small inventory of itself. The road needed to be under construction. Really? Now, as we travel on our journey into sobriety, we see a sign in the road that says, Slow, do not pass. Slow, do not pass. Admitted to God, to ourselves, or another human being, the exact nature of our wrongs. Slow. In other words, what do we mean, the exact nature? Motive. Motive. Sometimes, you know, we feel that when we think of taking... The fifth step, well, you know, after all, I think I can just pass this one up. No, friend. It wasn't put there to pass up. If I'm going to pass that up sooner or later, I'm going to pass up another. So it means to tell, it tells me. You see in that sign in the road when it says, slow, do not pass, it means what it says. The time will come when I will take it. The time did come. 
But you know one thing? In taking the fifth step, it tells me exactly how, you know, to admit to God and to ourselves and another human being. I love those words, another human being, because it tells me that I'm going to try to find or rape or something like that, but that isn't it at all. Uh-uh. Exact nature. My motive. Sometimes, you know, loneliness can be the exact nature of our wrongs. The exact nature is what I did was I was lonely. Many times we get into all kinds of mischief because we're lonely. Not what I did, but why? My motive. I had to be around another human being. Motive. See, loneliness has caused more crime than poverty ever dreamed of. So that was it. Motive. Not what I did, but my motive for doing it. You know. Sometimes, you know, it's like the man, you know, that goes to come to AA, you know, he wants to be big shot. And he drops ten dollars. Before he puts the ten dollars in the basket, he waves it all over the room. Let's everybody see how generous he is. And the minute the meeting is over, he goes back and takes out nine ones, you know. <laughs> one of those his motive, he wants everybody to say, ah, isn't he marvelous? Look at him. He just gives all of his life and his money to everything. Yeah, his motive. Baby shot is. Sometimes, our motive, the exact nature of my wrongs can simply be the second step. I cannot believe in a power greater than myself. I am God. Exact nature of my wrongs. I cannot believe that there's anything any greater than me. And isn't it pitiful when a man or woman that cannot rise up out of his own puke will think that there's nothing greater than him. Or that he's reached such heights in AA that everybody should be paying him a band. For what? Because Almighty God showed you the beauty of his grace. Yeah. You know what AA tells us? We have only one authority, our loving God. And yet, sometimes, we've got to be him. I think we better cool it along those lines, you know? And as we travel on our journey into sobriety, we see a sign in the road that says the detour. That sixth step. We're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. You know. You know, the big book tells us we thought we could hold on to our old ideas and the result was nil until we let go absolutely. So now those old ideas I had better be for. You know, all oh, this ambition that I have got since I've come back into a age, you know. I've gotten sober, rather. So I've got so much ambition. Is it ambition? Or is it simply greed? Am I living by one of our slogans? Live and let live. Or, you know, I have my ego told me. Now I've got to go down there and run everything. You tried to run everything before. Well, and I've got to be first. And I've got to do it right now. I've got to get to the top right now. And we've learned in here one day at a time. And then on the, on the other hand, sometimes you want to come up with this malarkey. Well, you know, I could stay sober if I could get my wife back. If I could get my job back, coming again, you know? And what do they tell us? First things first. First things first. My sobriety must come first, you know? Well, you know, I wish I could walk to stay sober. Have you seen these people, you know? I wish I could walk to stay sober. I want to wish I could stay sober. Well, action is the magic word. 
If we want to hold on to our old ideas, we want to go to sleep and wake up and have instant sobriety. And it don't work like that, my dear. Not at all. You can get drunk instantly, but you can't get sober instantly. And all you got to do is take that first thing. Or have I gotten so far along in the program now that i got to criticize those when they come in, you know, and uh, they're just not doing so good. Well, you know, here comes so-and-so. I don't think he belongs in our group. You know, after all, I'm such and such a group, so I can't be bothered with him. And uh, I don't know whether I have time to waste too much time with him or not. But for the grace of God, I can get down right down there with him. One of those kind of things. So you see, my friends, those, all those old ideas has got to go. But those old character defects that I had, they got to go. Yeah. Entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Now, if you'll notice, I don't say anything about being willing. It's just ready. See, I get up every morning and I get ready to go to work. Some mornings I'm not so willing. <laughs> but finally come Thursday, which is payday, I'm the one there that's first. I become willing. <laughs> because why? Of the friend's benefit. See? And then when I take my check, I'm so glad that I went. And it's the same way with everything else. The same way with my program right here. When I can see the benefit, then I become willing because I got ready first. You know. Then as we travel a little further on our journey into sobriety, we see a few signs in the road that says bumps and curves. And you think, oh, well, those are very small words. I don't need to pay any attention to those. They're just small things, bumps and curves. Well, oh, but they are, they are important. Because it tells us to humbly, we humbly ask him to remove our shortcomings. We're so busy, thing. But you'd better believe it. These, this is the detonator that sets off the bomb. My character defect is the bomb. You know? My shortcomings is a detonator. I have to watch these things. It's just like we watch those small signs in the road that says, Bumps and curves. Now, you know, you say, oh, I have a curve. I don't pay any attention to that. You know, it's a small word. But here you are. you got a Volkswagen. How do you know it's not a Mack truck coming around the corner? You know? <laughs> so, but you're going to ignore it. Both of don't pay any attention to that. The first thing you know, you'd be laying over there with the cows, and you don't even, even have a milker with you. One of those. <laughs> so, have to watch these things. So, I have to look at these small things, you know. See, those little babies, they see, when I, when I was a child growing up, I was taught this in school. Avoid the near occasion of sin. You know, you probably, some of you learned that too as a kid. Avoid the near occasion. Well, I went around looking for the first occasion, you know. <laughs> but you see, I learned to apply those words in this program. Avoid the near occasion to that first drink. So I've got to watch out for those bumps and curves. What are some of the bumps and curves? Pretense. That's one of them. It's a small one. Pretense. Am I staying sober for me, or am I just pretending that I am staying sober for me? Am I really staying sober for me? Because I want to be sober for me. Or am I pretending this for a short while to get what I want back? Procrastination. That's another bump. Or a curve, you know. In other words, you know, I, I didn't tell the doctor that um, I was taking pills, you know, uh, all this self-medication. I, I, I didn't tell him that. But as soon as I get over this hump, I'm going to tell him. No. But I don't tell him that right now. I don't tell anybody, hey, look, kid, I got a pill problem, too. I don't tell that. Because you can't smell them. But here we are, taking them pills. You know. Just pile them down. Some of you open some women's pocketbook, looks like a apothecary when you turn it upside down. And see so many damn pills in it. Like my We keep putting that off, well, I'm going to stop taking these pills one of these days. Yeah, you will stop taking them one of these days. You better move, you're going to stop taking them. <laughs> And then there's reservation. That's another bump 
occur. That reservation, you know, any time I hear these words, well, I'm so in a day, but I may be drunk tomorrow. Oh, you got a reservation there, baby. What do you mean you're sober today? If you're sober today, good. What are you worrying about tomorrow for? No. They have a reservation. I don't like to tell my new people that. Well, I tell them, yes, okay, we're sober one day at a time. That's all. We don't worry about tomorrow. You know, when I first came in to AA, you know, we used to tell the new people, and they told me. They just told me that's a long time ago. Stay with us for 90 days. If you don't like it, we'll refund all your misery. They don't tell them people that now. See? They say, oh, stay with us for 90 days, and if you don't like it, we'll make you a counselor, and then you can make everybody miserable. <laughs> that's no lie, kid. I've never seen so many... Well, that's okay. <laughs> To be in one myself. <laughs> I had one, you know, get a degree that long, and she walked up to me and went, I didn't go and ask them for the job they sent for me. She says, ah. she went on to tell me about all of her degrees. All of she says, I want to get degrees. I said, I have my PhD. Oh, yeah, yeah. I said, yeah, pile of hell and damnation. <laughs> That's all I need. That's my degrees right there, you know. That's all right. You find out how much you love us when the government withdraws some of that money. You find out how much you love us. But as we travel on our journey into sobriety, we now see a sign in the road that says, Watch for ice on the bridge. This takes to him since 8 and 9, made a list of all persons who have harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Made direct amends to such people whenever possible, except when to do so would injure their mother. We see this sign on the road that says, Watch for ice on the bridge. Proceed with caution. Why must I watch for that ice on the bridge? This is why it is so necessary that I have a good spiritual foundation, my friends, because quite possibly there may be ice on that bridge. See, not everybody is welcome, is going to open, welcome me back with open arms and say, ah, you dear sweet little thing, what you did didn't mean anything. You know, uh-uh, no, no, no. You know, that, that, that's a tough titty, but you need the milk. I must make amends to them, you know. Oh, you say, no, no, there's no must. There's no must in the book. Well, then you must read the big book because there are. There's a must in that book. 43 pieces of age, 43 and 46. There's some more there. You know, I got them all little down. Well, nevertheless, <coughs> in making amends, my friends, I had the list. I must make amends to me first. Anything else is still hypocrisy. You say, wouldn't you be a little dubious of a man or a woman that had stolen your shoes? And uh, here he comes back with a pair of brand new shoes under his arms, but he's barefooted as a goose. 
And he's got a pair of brand new shoes. And he says, I, I stole the shoes. And I walked all the way over here barefooted to bring them back to you, you know, right away. You said, now, wait a minute. Now, he's up to something. You don't come over here to me barefooted to bring me back some shoes you stole from me. You're going to hide your socks because you think he's going to steal them next. No, no my friend. For I know himself be true. See? I make amends to myself first mentally. I got to start thinking differently. I must make amends to myself physically. I got to treat myself better. You say, oh, well, you know, why are you worried about all that treating yourself better mentally and physically? You know, that's all. You ate worse than that when you was drunk up here, but I ain't drunk now. You know, nothing is too good for me now. You know, nothing. You know, that's the way I feel about it. So I make amends to myself spiritually. Yeah. Because if I don't make amends to myself spiritually, I'm not going to do too well. I'm not going to do well at all mentally. Physically. Yes, my friends, amends. But you know, just in case that that person that I tried to make amends to rejects me, if I don't have a good spiritual foundation, or if I've been staying sober for just that particular thing, I'm going to have some trouble, you know? That's why. I got to see after number one. This I must do. So I make amends to myself. And any time that I've got to buy you back, I'll injure you. Sometimes the person, the first thing you say, what are you going to give me? Honey, take me. That's all i got to give you. I'll try to make amends the best I can. But you see, if I've got to buy you back, I injure you. Because anything that you have to keep buying back, you get marked down and bronze on the bargain table. So I'm not buying anybody back. Now, if it costs me money to buy you back, now if I owe you money, I'm going to pay you. You know? But what about these people that come and tell me, well, you know, I made amends to my bartender. I paid him everything I owed him. I said, you made reservations. <laughs> yeah, you didn't make any man. You made a reservation. <laughs> Somebody talks about him paying his alimony, he don't hear you. You know, one of those kind of things. So when I make a man's hunt, to thine own self be true. It tells me to love thy neighbor as myself. Well, that means I've got to love me too. Because if I'd ever treated my neighbor the way that I did me, I wouldn't be here tonight. I'd be in jail, you know? So I've got to. If I have to, so I'm going to try to love you. I've got to love me, too. Anything else, my friends, is your hypocrisy. Yeah? So now it tells me. I see a sign in the road that says, No U turn. Continue to take personal inventory and when you were wrong, promptly admitted. No you turn. Now you ever notice when you go down the road and you see the sign that says no U turn, many times accompanying this sign you will also see a sign that says for authorized vehicles only. <laughs> authorized now that is for the person. Now you know some people are going to try that. Now, for authorized, we know who the authorized vehicles are that can go over there. It says that for authorized vehicles only. Now, that is for those of us that feel that we've had a course in AA and um, we did it all now, you know, uh, in, uh, shall we say, three easy lessons. You know, I went to three meetings and uh, they didn't let me run the thing, so I quit. Mm -hmm. And uh, furthermore, I don't like those people down there. Well, you authorize if you think you know it all. And I don't want to hear that God stuff you're talking about. Well, you that's for authorized vehicles only. You can go back any time you get ready, but we'll be right here waiting on you, you know, one of those kind of things. And, uh, you know, you ever made that little turn there where it says for authorized vehicles only or made a no U-turn? It was always in there somebody over there waiting on you, wasn't they? You know, man, she got over there. Now, this no U-turn sign that we see, what are some of the things that causes me to make this U-turn? Many times we will feel, well, 
But we're not continuing to take that personal inventory. We've got to make this U-turn sickness. So we get sick, and we feel, well, you know, after all, I'm sick. And since I feel so bad, maybe I should use a little alcohol for medicinal purposes. Baloney. You yeah. know, no, don't work. A friend of mine one day told me a long time ago, she said, um, I was talking about how bad a tooth hurts. She said, well, I didn't know you don't drink because you just hold it in your mouth. I said, oh, baloney. Just hold it in your mouth. Now, that makes a lot of sense. You know, I'm going to hold whiskey in my mouth? No. Sickness news. That's how we get that U-turn. We're going to use it for medicinal purposes only. Sometimes, you know, I lose my job. Well, this is a good reason. Here I was, I come back into, I'm in AA and I'm doing all right, or I came back into AA and I lost my job. So I'm going to get drunk about that. Is that what you came back here for? Is that what you came in for in the first place, your job? So then we take the U-turn. Sometimes we get divorce papers. After you say it's over, get divorce papers up under your nose. Uh oh, that's a good time for a U turn. Oh, you knew he was going to divorce you, or she was going to divorce you anyway. I probably should. Yeah. <laughs> so there's no reason to take a U turn. And then again, we come down with this plain old thing. Well, you know what happened there? Oh, I just got bored. I'm sorry, but I got bored. So you got bored. Well, if you got constipated, you wouldn't go out and buy a stick of dynamite, would you? <laughs> you got bored. <laughs> it's the same thing. Because you got bored. We travel on our general disability. We see a sign in the road, a beautiful sign, we're traveling, that says this gas, food, and lodging. Stop through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact, praying only for the knowledge of His will for us and the power to carry that out. Gas, food, and lodging. How do we identify this gas? It's powerful. Food, spiritual food. Talk through prayer and meditation. Lodging, friends, we are home. Here it is. Gas, food, and lodging. Right here. But generally, always when we see this beautiful sign, we will also see another sign that will shake us back to reality. And it'll be, you know, it's like sometimes you're driving along a beautiful highway, and although you are tired, it's beautiful, you know. Sometimes when we look at this beautiful 11th step where we start through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact, praying only for the knowledge of will for some part of care, you think, oh, this is a beautiful step. And it is a beautiful step. Just like that beautiful highway that you see out there and you're tired and you see those signs. There's always something that will take you back to reality. You see a sign that says, watch for falling rocks, you know. And sometimes we get so, shall we say, wound up with the beauty of this step that we forget about the falling rocks. And you know what the falling rocks are, just when you're going along nice, and everything's going along nice and beautiful. Somebody will have the unmitigated nerve to say to you, you still have to go to that thing. Well, Marjorie, honey, I'm telling you, you've been sober all this time, but I don't see no difference in you. You're still the same bastard you always were. <laughs> Falling up. So you go away, and you say, when he comes to AA, I don't understand it. I guess he just comes with the coffee and donuts. He never says nothing. No. Falling up. Poor fellow, he don't know nothing to say. He wants you to say something to him. You know, falling around. So, okay. So you hang around the women all the time and you try to help the new women. There's something wrong with her. Mm. Okay. You know, I just see some women people. <laughs> so, okay, so then you talk to the men. <coughs> mm. 
She's looking for a man. <laughs> so you don't talk to nobody. You'll smile. <laughs> Call him up. That's it. You won't find him. But let's look at the beautiful part of the step. Well, one has the privilege where we sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact. You see, my friends, if I hadn't paid any, any attention to step two and three, I can't do nothing with eleven. Because you can, and cannot improve your conscious contact with somebody that you don't know. You know. And this is the beautiful part about it. Beautiful part about it. As we travel on our journey into sobriety, we see a sign in the road that says, End of Divided Highway. End of Divided Highway that tells me, having had a spiritual awakening, as a result of these steps, as a result of them, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. End of Divided Highway. In other words, what is it telling me? That my life now must be a complete life. I must keep striving for this. There is one thing that I cannot do. I must try to practice these principles in all my affairs, not compromise my principles, but practice them. All this before it was something that I had to compromise. But now I no longer must compromise these things. I practice. But a new person, I'd like to say, when you start on your journey, if you're starting on your journey into sobriety, after you've had your old car taken care of, there's one thing be sure that you try to get, friends. Please. New people. Get you four good new tires. Communication. Identification. As you start out, self-examination and determination. You may not be ever be a steering wheel, but you might be the nut that holds that steering wheel on there, you know? But make sure you've got four new tires. Good. For the older person that keeps going in and out, in and out, you say, well, I get weary, I get tired. I pray, but it don't do no good. I keep losing the battle. Remember, one of the greatest people that ever lived was Moses, you know. And, you know, Moses one day, when the Israelites were having a heck of a battle there with the Amorites or Philistines or somebody or other that, as long as he held his hands up and he prayed, the battle went his way. But he got tired, too. You know, he had a rod in his hand. He got so tired of holding this rod. But he was scared to let his arms down because he knew that the enemy would gain the victory. So he sent out and he got two of his closest wives. He got Aaron and her. That they could hold up his arms while he prayed. Don't go nowhere, please. If you're tired, come back and let us hold up your hands. We cannot do it for you, but we can hold up your hands while you pray. You know? Because it's lonesome out there. And it's lonely out there. And for the man or woman that is still here, the old timer, I don't care whether they call you a bleeding deacon or not. Hang in there. Just keep hanging in there and bleeding anyway. Yeah. So that you two can stand tall like Paul and say, I fought the good fight. I finished my course, and I've kept the faith. God bless you.